Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for coming to my talk today. My name is Boris Kolpakov. I'm a founder and a software designer at Code Synthesis, a company focused on the development of open source tools and libraries for C++. The topic of today's presentation is practical C++ 11 techniques that I learned while adding C++ 11 support to ODB and then using the result in a couple of applications. ODB is an object relational mapping system for C++. If you are interested in object persistence, then I'm, going, I'm giving another talk on C++ 11 and ODB tomorrow at 11. No pun intended. Now, in the past couple of years, there's been a lot of blog posts and articles published on, on using C++ 11. But when I read them, I invariably get this feeling that they are at best based on library <coughs> development experiences and at worst, some theoretical musings. And as Richard Feynman famously noted, the imagination of nature is far, far greater than the imagination of man. So what I want to focus on today is, every, is practical C++ 11 techniques for everyday application development rather than careful library handcrafting. Not that application development is sloppy in comparison. It's just we may not be able to afford some of the techniques that are because they are too time consuming or will result in a maintenance nightmare. Just to give you a concrete example, it can be perfectly fine for a library to provide, say, 10 overloads of the same constructor in order to achieve the best performance in every possible case. However, in, in everyday development, we might strongly prefer a solution with, the, with a single constructor, even though it's, it may not be optimal in all the cases. So what, what we are going to try to do today is to come up with a bunch of hard and fast rules of thumb, which we can apply for everyday C++11 development. This way, next time you type auto or a double ampersand, you won't have to take a long pause and think, how am I going to use this feature in this particular case? So that's the goal. <clears throat> I also don't pretend to have all the answers. In fact, there's one problem that I'm going to talk about for which I don't really have a good answer. So I'm hoping maybe you guys will also teach me a thing or two. Finally, this is not an introduction to C++11. In particular, I assume basic knowledge of our value references, uh, perfect forwarding, auto and the range based for loop. Okay, so all the warnings out of the way. And let's start with auto or the type deduction from initializer as it is formally known. Yeah, feel free to interrupt and ask questions if something is not <coughs> clear. As you may remember, auto is not substituted with the exact type of the initializer. Rather, it always has its top le level reference stripped. At first, this might seem like a bizarre idea. It definitely seemed like strange to me at first. But if you think about it, it actually makes a lot of sense. Think of a type of a variable x in our case as having two parts, its core type, int in our case, and its constness, referenceness. The core type can be naturally deduced from the initializer expression, while constness and referenceness really depends on what we intend to do with the, with the value further down in our code. Are we going to just access it? Then we probably <coughs> should make it a const reference. Are we going to modify it? If so, then are we modifying a shared object or a private copy? If it's shared, then it should probably, it, it should be a reference, otherwise it should be a value. In a sense, by stripping top level reference, auto forces us to specify our intentions. What are we going to do with the value? And there you have it, our first rule of thumb. Make the va variable const auto reference if you are not planning to modify it. Make it a reference if you're modifying a shared object and make it a value if you're modifying a private copy. Let's now take a look at, a, at some concrete examples of each case. 
Here we have a vector of shared pointers to some potentially expensive to copy object. <coughs> first example, in the first example, we want to print the last, the last element, the, the last object. Notice that if we just typed auto without the const reference, we would have made a copy of the object, probably something that we don't intend to do. Second example is shows how, how we can modify a shared object. In this case, the shared pointer. The last example is the all too familiar loop iteration, a container iteration loop. Here we modify a private copy of the iterator. All good so far? Okay. Now, some of you notice that this top level reference and const stripping of auto mimics that of automatic template argument deduction. In fact, in the standard, auto is defined in terms of template argument deduction. For example, here it's not immediately obvious what the type of the variable x will be. Well, for some, might not be. But if we restate it in, in terms of template argument deduction, then I think most people have developed a pretty good intuition of what the deduced type will be. So I think it's, most of you will be able to quickly say that t is a resolved to constant then x becomes constant reference. Okay, so everyone is happy with this? No objections? Okay, moving on. So the auto was fairly simple. Let's now consider some more interesting things and start with perfect forwarding. I don't believe you will use this feature a lot in everyday application development. However, what might happen is you can end up with perfect forwarding without even realizing it. <coughs> and that can have some really strange consequences, as, as we will see now. But first, let's quickly recap what this perfect forwarding is all about. Essentially, when a compiler sees an uh, argument of this type, it applies special template argument deduction rules. If we pass an L value to this function, then the template argument T resolves to an L value reference, and once the reference collapsing is applied, X becomes an L value reference. Now, if we pass an R value, then the template argument, the template parameter T resolves to just value without any references. And the argument type becomes an R value reference. To put it another way, <coughs> with perfect forwarding, we always get a reference, but the kind of reference we get mimics that of the argument passed. Okay? Good. We just talked about this equivalence of auto and template argument deduction. Because of this, the special perfect forwarding rules are also applied to auto. While I don't believe you will use this feature in ordinary code a lot, it can be quite handy in generic programming. For example, we can we, if we need <coughs> to forward an unknown return value from one function to another. And we'll see another example of, of this feature further down in my slides. Okay, so far perfect forwarding seems like a nice mellow feature that can be quite handy sometimes. Let's now turn to its other greedy side. Let's say we have uh, an overloaded set of functions that take an integer or a string. Here are also some sample calls to this function, and it's the versions that, that actually get called. Nothing surprising here, right? Let's, let's now say we want to forward all other w values to some function g. Sounds easy, right? Equipped with our understanding of, of perfect forwarding, we quickly add another overload. Let's now see what happens to our calls. Well, the first two calls are unchanged and do exactly what we want. But what happened to the last two? This is definitely not something that we expect or want. 
we expect the compiler to prefer the to select the most specialized function, which in this case means that it should select our non-template functions over our forwarding function. As it turns out, this is still the rule, but things are now more complicated because of perfect forwarding. Remember the whole idea of perfect forwarding is that we get a perfect parameter type no matter what we pass to this function. So the compiler will still choose a non-template over forwarding function as long as the parameter type of this non-template matches perfectly. Otherwise, the perfect forwarding function is always a better match. With this understanding, I think it's fairly easy to explain what's going on with our calls. In the first call, we pass an our value, and both our first overload and the forwarding function match, and both match perfectly. So the non-template is selected. The second call is similar, except here we pass an R value. The last two calls are more interesting in that we get a, something that we didn't expect. The, the second last call, in the second last call, we pa the argument type is an R value reference to standard string. Both our second overload and the forwarding function match, but only the forwarding function matches perfectly. That's why it's called. The, in the last call, last call is, is pretty similar. The argument type is an all value reference to an array of, of four const characters. The forwarding function is happy to oblige again, while our string overload can only be called with an implicit conversion. So it's not even in the race. Now, notice something else interesting here. It's quite possible that in the last call, the, the call to function g inside our forwarding function will also require an implicit conversion. But this fact is not taken into <coughs> account during overload resolution. In other words, perfect forwarding hides implicit conversions. Okay? Yes, question. So if you had one, an overload that was just uh, passed by value std string, would the third one be passed to that function? Do I need to repeat the question? Okay, so the question was, if we pass by value here, will the third call do what we expect it to do? And the answer is yes, but interestingly, the fourth call will still require an implicit conversion. Okay. Any other questions? <coughs> okay. Now, here we actually understood that we are doing perfect forwarding. There also can be situations where you end up with perfect forwarding without even realizing it. This actually happened to me. I had a perfectly fine piece of C++ 98 code that looked something like this. And then, while adding C++ 11 support, I thought, hey, I'm making a copy of the ID. Let me add an R value overload for efficiency. Needless to say, it took me a while to figure out why, why everything all of a sudden fell apart. So, are there any rules we can pull out of this? Well, one would be, whenever you write T double M percent and T is a template parameter, it's not an R value reference. So just be careful that T might, it might not always be T, it can be some, something else. But as long as it's in this form and type is a template parameter, it, it is, just think about it as not an R value reference. Second rule would be that perfect forwarding and overload resolution don't mix well. What if, if we really need to make perfect forwarding and overloading work? Is there any way? The answer is yes, though it's not particularly pretty or, or maintainable for that matter. The idea is to use enable if or a more convenient wrapper to disable the forwarding function for all the types that are handled by other overloads in our set. So here we disable it for integers and strings. At the end of the of my talk, I'm going to give a link to a blog post which has more information on this. 
as well as the implementation of this disable forward class template. Okay, everyone is good. Another feature that I believe we'll use a lot in everyday application development is the range-based for loop. But how many of you know what's actually inside this range-based for loop? This, this can be useful, for example, to answer questions like whether the iteration will be const or non-const if we pass an R value. Or how can we adapt our own or some third third-party container to be compatible with the range-based for? Or how can we iterate backwards with the range-based for? So in other words, do a reverse iteration. So to answer this question, it's actually good to know what's, what's in, what, what happens inside. According to the standard, this the range-based for loop has this equivalent plane for loop. Now, when I say equivalent, I, I mean that the lo actual logic is equivalent and not that it its actual translation. In particular, we cannot refer to the range or to the pair of iterators from within our code. We, for example, we cannot increment an iterator to skip an element. Okay, the, the plain version looks, looks quite a bit more complicated than the range-based form. So let's examine it line by line and start with the range initialization. Here we see Another example of auto-perfect forwarding. The idea here is that if expression is an L value, then range becomes an L value reference. Again, again reference collapsing is applied, as we discussed earlier. <coughs> if, however, expression is an R value, then range becomes an R value reference. By now, I think we all know that, an R that the named R value reference is treated as an L value, which and here we get an answer to our first question. If we iterate over an R value, then the iteration will be non-const. Which, make, which make is, makes it possible to write this code even though it's quite pointless. Where can we use that? The only idea I had is to somehow <coughs> use modifications to the container in order to direct the iteration. I definitely haven't had any real world usage for this. Okay, so the next, next block is a pretty standard for loop header. We'll talk about the begin and end expressions <coughs> in a moment. Notice also that the range-based for caches the end iterator, which makes it as efficient as we would have written ourselves. So if, you need, if the logic provided by the range-based for is what you need, don't try to implement your own for efficiency. It will be just as efficient. Notice also that there's no provision for container modifications during iteration. So in other words, if you modify a container during iteration, then bad things will probably happen. The last interesting part is the declaration. Now, if we, if we specify the element type explicitly, then everything is pretty straightforward. However, we can also ask the C++ compiler to deduce the element type for us. In this case, our auto rules of thumb apply. And in particular, if you're not planning to modify the element, make it a const auto reference. OK, let's now take a look at the begin and end expressions from the loop here. What can we iterate over with a range based for? Well, we can iterate over CRAs. We can iterate over brace initializer lists and user-defined types that provide the notion of iteration. The first two cases are not really interested, interesting because they are handled by the language. So we'll concentrate on the last case. If, if range is of a user-defined type that declares begin and end functions, then the begin and end expressions simply call these functions. Otherwise, the compiler will search for freestanding begin and end that it can call with a range as a single argument. Now, this search is performed argument-dependent lockup. 
This fallback to the freestanding begin and end allows us to non-invasively adapt our own or some third-party containers to be compatible with a range-based interface. OK, by default, range-based 4 does straight iteration. But it's fairly easy to write a little adapter which, allow, which will allow us to do a reverse iteration. In fact, it's strange that something like this is not in the standard library. So here's some interesting C++11 code that I'll let you meditate on for a second. Oops, sorry. Okay. And here's this little helper that will create one for us. This is kind of an, a recurring idea, make shared make unique, make a uh, tuple, and this one is creating our adapter. And that's how we can use <coughs> it to, iter to reverse iterate over some container V. Okay. Everyone is on board? Okay, now we got to the trickiest part of my talk, and that is efficient argument passing in C++11. I think you've noticed that this is a recurring discussion about what is the best way to pass things in C++11. So we're going to try to answer this question. I don't think anyone will argue that the most important feature in C++11 is the R-value reference and the move semantics that it enables. Now, in many cases, it actually becomes more efficient to allocate objects on the stack and move them around rather than use dynamic memory and smart pointers. There are two parts to this moving of stack objects around. It's returning them from functions and also passing them as arguments to functions. Want to pass? OK. So there are two parts, returning them from functions and passing them to functions. The returning side is actually covered pretty well by C++11. Specifically, if an all value is returned from a function that ceases to exist at the end of this function, then it is automatically treated as an R value and moved out rather than copied out of the function. So it's nice and clean. The passing side is a bit more complicated. Consider this function as an example. This is a pretty idiomatic signature for C++ 98. And it will work just fine in C++ 11. However, the performance this, of this function may not be optimal depending on what it does with its argument. If this function simply accesses the vector without making any copies, then it is as efficient as it gets. However, if the, if the function <coughs> does need to make a copy and we pass an R value, then its performance can be improved and potentially significantly. To see why, <coughs> consider this call to our function f. Here's what will happen. A temporary vector will be initialized from the brace initializer list. This temporary will then be passed to our function. Inside the function, we make a copy of the temporary and once the function returns, we destroy the temporary. Do you see the potential optimization here? Instead of copying the temporary, we could have just moved, moved it into our own instance. So how can we, how can we make sure that our, yes, question. So you say it's 
copy. This isn't going to force a copy. Are you saying the implementation would, by choice, make a copy? Because well, the the impl. Because it's yeah. it's a. Oh, oh, I see. Never mind. I, is it because yeah. of, of the conversion from the initializer list? I had the same question. Okay, I'll repeat the question. So the question is why why are these copies made? Is it our own choice or is it the implementation that forces it somehow? So th there are basically two objects will be created. The first will, is the vector that is initialized from the brace initializer list here in order to pass some, this object to the function. And it's passed by const reference. Right. Okay. Yeah, it's temporary, so it's a, it is an R value. Inside the function, it's our own choice. We we agreed that this function makes a copy. Okay, and there we make a copy of this temporary, and then the temporary is destroyed, and instead of making a copy of it, we could have just moved its state into our own object. Okay, everyone's good. So how can we make sure that our functions? copy L values and move R values. Well, the recommended way is to provide another overload on the R value reference. There are a couple of issues with this approach, however. First of all, we now have two functions instead of one, which means we either have to duplicate the logic or we have to create yet another common implementation function. So not particularly elegant. This is, however, a bigger issue with this approach. A typical function that needs to make copies of its arguments is a constructor, which initializes a bunch of data members with the values passed. So for example, here we have an email class. In order to make its constructor R value aware, we'll have to provide an overload for every R value, L value combination of its three arguments. And that would be eight overloads. <laughs> Here, they just the signatures. Awesome. Yeah, cool. Looks brutal, doesn't it? OK, so are there any other options? Is there anything better that we can do? Well, another one trick that I don't know who came up with this idea first is to pass by value. In, instead of passing by reference R value on, or L value, we pass by value. The idea here is to make the compiler decide at the function call site whether to copy or move the value. If we pass an L value, if we use this pass by value approach and we pass an L value, then it will be copied into the argument and inside of our function we move it into our own instance. So the total cost is one copy and one move. If, however, we pass an R value, then it will be moved into an argument. And inside our function, we again move it into our own instance. So total cost is two moves. Now, if you calculate the cost of the overload on our value reference approach, you will get, well, one copy in case of an R value and one move in case of an R value, which means that for the pass by value approach, the, the overhead is one move, one extra move in each case. Now we expect move to be cheap. So this is a pretty good deal when the alternative is this. Right? There are, however, some problems with this as well. First of all, this method only works if we know for sure that we are going to make a copy. If we don't make a copy and we pass an L value, then this approach will have an extra copy over here compared to the const reference signature. When do we not know whether the function needs to make a copy or not? Well, one example is when a function needs to make 
a copy only in certain cases. So it's a conditional copy. The other would be when a function, for example, a virtual function can have multiple implementations. <coughs> Just think about it. With the pass by value approach, we embed the assumption about the function's implementation into its interface. Not, not a very clean design, to say the least. Also note that this, that, that pass by value will only work if the type is movable. And by work, I mean it won't result in poor performance. That's why, for example, this approach is not suitable for, say, a generic container. Some people I saw on the net, some people suggest that standard vector should have used pass by value in, in pushback instead of providing an R value overload. That's a bad idea because the element type might not be movable. There are also some more obscure problems, and I'll give a link to the blog report, blog post, which discusses them in more detail. OK, so while pass by value is definitely a viable option in certain cases, it's by no means a universal solution. So are there any other options? Well, another option, favored, for example, by Scott Mayers, is to use perfect forwarding. The idea here is, is basically to make the C++ compiler generate all the necessary R value, L value permutations for us. Sounds elegant at the first sight, but this, this approach has a long list of really, really bad problems. First of all, because we're using perfect forwarding, it has to be a template, which means cannot be used for virtual functions. Then perfect forwarding has this nasty feature of pushing the diagnostics into our implementation. Just to give you an example, let's say we pass an integer for a first name. The compile error will point inside our constructor implementation here, instead of to the line where we actually call the constructor. Then, as we just saw, perfect forwarding is incompatible with overloading, so that mechanism is also out. Generally, this idea of loose and typeless interface that is happy to accept anything, I don't know, it sounds crazy to me. Might as well just program in Python. There are also some more obscure problems, such as con changing of implicit conversion to explicit. Again, I have a blog post that discusses this in, in much more detail. OK, so no cigar here either. <coughs> By the way, Scott Mayers uses this term universal re reference for perfect forwarding. I don't like it. And the reason I don't like it is because it implies that we have a one function which is capable of, of handling both R values and R values. While in reality, what we get is a bunch of functions, each of which can only handle one type of reference. I don't know if that makes sense. OK. So let's, let's step back a bit and think what it, what it is that we need here? What mechanism would satisfy our requirements? It seems what we need is a, is an, is a reference-like type which binds to both R values and L values and allows us to distinguish between the two at runtime. Unfortunately, nothing like, the, like this exists in C++11. So the question is now, can we create our own, maybe? And the answer is we can actually create a class template that provides the semantics. Here's how we can use it to implement our constructor. So we basically change our types to use our truly universal reference. Here's what the interface of our URF class template can look like. Just to give a, give a few kind of notes on the implementation, it's, it's actually quite complex, and it took me 
several iterations to get it right. But the, the kind of to, to summarize it, basic idea is it actually kind of tames the perfect forwarding approach a bit. So un underneath there is a lot of perfect forwarding going on where the three dots are. So yeah, that's how it's implemented. But again, I have I have an implementation that we, you can take a look at. Okay, so what are the problems with this one? I think by now you, 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 you realize that all of them have some problems. The biggest problem with this approach is actually, um, it's actually conceptual rather than technical. It is non-idiomatic. We use a non-core language feature for something as fundamental as efficiently passing values to functions. I mean, this, this could probably change if something like this ends up in the standard and, and is widely used, but yeah, I doubt it. While, while the users of our class don't need to do anything special, inside the class things are not as pretty. Because now our value is wrapped, we cannot access its members directly. Instead, we have to explicitly unwrap it not particularly elegant. Okay, so we've examined three different methods of four if you count also the overload on our value reference and none of them without flaws. I would like to tell you that there's a single method in C++11 that works in all the cases, but unfortunately this doesn't seem to be the case. In fact, one can argue that C++11 actually complicates things in this area compared to C++98. Yes, in C++98 you may not be able to achieve the same efficiency when it comes to argument passing, but at least the choice was simple. Pass by const reference and move on to more important things. In this area, C++11 became even more of an expert's language where every situation needs to be carefully analyzed and an intricate solution applied depending on the conditions. Anyway, can we somehow choose one rule that works you know, reasonably well in most cases? Well, I would say if you, if you have to choose one, one method, then make it the true and tried, C++ 98, pass by const reference. Yes, if the function makes a copy of its argument and we pass an R value, we will miss on the potential optimization. But in return, you get the freedom not to think about this stuff anymore. You simply apply the rule and move on. In fact, one can argue that this whole discussion is one misguided exercise in premature optimization. because. In, in, in most applications, in most cases, it won't really matter how you pass your arguments. And in a few cases, which as experience tells us, we can only identify with the help of a profiler, we can always use a more suitable approach. So if, just, if you want to keep it simple, just pass by const reference and forget about it. Then if your application doesn't perform, profile it and see. Okay, let's say we can relax our requirements a bit and allow ourselves to choose between two methods. Can we come up with a simple set of rules that would allow us to select an, an appropriate method in most cases and without spending too much time on it? Well, the approach that came closest to satisfying our requirements is pass by value. So let's try and see if we can combine somehow pass by value and pass by const reference to come up with a simple set of rules. The biggest problem with pass by, by value is the need to know whether the function makes a copy or not. It also has, means that we embed the assumption about the function's implementation into its interface. And in, in quite a few cases, real-world cases, it can be hard or impossible to determine. 
for example, one implementation can just copy the object all the time and the other one can cache it and only copy it sometimes. So things like that. One approximation that we can use is to think about argument, argument copying, copying conceptually rather than actually. That is, when we pass an argument to a function, we ask ourselves, does this function conceptually need to make a copy? If yes, then we pass by value, otherwise we pass by const reference. Now, I don't, it, th this approximation won't result in optimal performance in every case, but I think it will have a pretty good average. In the blog post that I mentioned la later, I actually analyzed quite a few examples and in most cases it actually matched, you know, the conceptual part matched what actually happened physically. So here's the decision, the decision tree for this rule of thumb. First we ask if the function makes a copy conceptually. If the answer is no, then we pass by const reference. If the answer is yes, then we pass by value. Also, based on some real evidence, such as output of a profiler, we can optimize a select few cases, for example, with R value overloads. This is, however, one, one fairly prominent case where this doesn't cut it. And that is polymorphic move. I'm sure mo most of you are familiar with with the, with the polymorphic copy constructor idiom or virtual copy constructor as it is sometimes called. Here's the outline of what I have in mind. Now that we can also move, it's natural to want to do polymorphic move. Here's a motivating example. A polymorphic move would be really handy inside the add implementation. The natural, kind of the first instinct is to simply add another function next to clone. And the good thing is we don't even need to, to think hard what to call it. But I would argue it's actually better to overload clone on the R value this reference. Can anyone guess why it's better? Yes. So the answer was uh, compiler will pre pick one which is better, which is true, but where could it be when where can it be useful? Yes. Um, when constructing with uh, placement new, I think for example when it's a um shared pointer. So the answer was when constructing with placement new. Uh, no actually not. Well, let me give you the answer. It, it's more useful when we use it in generic code, such as in a forwarding function, where we don't really know whether f is r value <coughs> or l value reference. Here, the compiler will pick one that is most suitable. So in a sense, your answer was correct. It kind of just shows where, where it can be useful. Okay, so that was a little aside. Let's now take a look at the implementation of the add function from our fruit catalog example. This, is, this code is what we would have had before adding move support. Now that we have, now we can apply our, our rule for efficient argument passing and since add clearly makes a copy of its argument, we change it to pass by value, right? Anyone sees the problem? Uh, 
remember that this is a polymorphic object. Slicing. Yeah, that's right. So what happens now is we slice the object and lose its dynamic part. Everyone understands what happens. So when, when you have a polymorphic object, when you want to move a pass a polymorphic object by value to a function, it's not going to work. And the only two options left really is to either use an R value overload or use our reference wrapper. In this case, the overload on R value is clearly the better choice, right? It's just one argument, so it's trivial to add another overload. Here's, however, a situation that I'm facing in, in the real world. You know, these are all toy examples. In another project that I'm working on called XSD, we generate classes from XML schema. For those not familiar, XML schema is basically the specification of an XML vocabulary. In XML schemas, it's quite typical to have types with 10 or more required elements or attributes. And in C++, these are naturally translated to constructor arguments. So basically, when you construct a type, an instance of this type, you are forced to specify all the required elements and attributes, so kind of good interface design. And some of these arguments can be polymorphic. So if I apply the R-value overload approach to my problem, then for a 10-argument construct, I'm looking at generating 1,000 overloads. Just think about it. 10 construct arguments, 1,000 overloads. Those eight overloads look like a joke in comparison. So the only approach I, I have left here is really to use the wrapper, reference wrapper, non-idiomatic and all. OK, any questions about this? I must make a lot of sense since there's not that much question. <laughs> I expected a lot more, but yeah, I guess it's good. Let's hope it's a good sign. Okay, well, that was a bit depressing, I find. I don't know how about you, but yeah. Let's let's talk about uh, things that are a bit more fun to finish off. This is this actually, I don't know how many of you attended uh, Tiago's earlier uh, <coughs> presentation on C++ 11 support in Qt. So some of the things are, are <coughs> kind of the same with my experience, but th some of them are a bit different as well. So s some of you may still remember um, early C++ 98 days when we couldn't use most of the new cool features for years because the compilers just didn't implement them. In fact, I chatted to quite a few people. It seems that so, some of you are still using compilers that, you know, 20 years old. <laughs> I don't know how you can, you can stand it. Yes, but yeah. So the question is now, is this time different? And I believe the answer is both yes and no. The three most popular C++ compilers, GCC, Clang, and Visual Studio, they provide pretty adequate C++11 coverage. Well, to be more specific, GCC and Clang have a pretty much complete core language coverage, while Visual Studio is adequate. Also, the Visual Studio team seems to be concentrating more on features that are most useful for everyday development, such as auto or range-based for, at the expense of features that are more useful in library development, such as, for example, default template arguments for functions. So you are in a much better shape if you are using C++11 in application development, especially if you don't need compiler portability. Things, however, do resemble early C++ 98 days if you are trying to create a portable C++11 library. So the answer is yes if you do application development, and not so much if, 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 we do, if we try to create a portable library. Just to give you two 
two examples of this difference between between application li library development to highlight the the difference who knows what that is okay uh, anyone i'm going to say arduino yeah okay right yeah written i should have blocked it or something but yeah I, i'm sure most of you heard of of this project and what they do just to give you idea what we are talking about here it runs at 16 megahertz it has 32 kilobytes of flash that is your, your program cannot be larger than 32 kilobytes i mean of course there's no operating system on this thing so what do you think can we use c plus plus 11 on this thing yes As it turns out, we can. Not all of it, because Arduino doesn't have a runtime support, so things like exceptions don't work. <coughs> but we can use a pretty decent subset of C++11, including our value references, lambdas, initializer lists, auto, and range-based form. Just imagine using a lambda to handle an interrupt. Wouldn't that be cool? In contrast, is a fragment of a configuration file from ODB, another project that I work on. ODB has to support all popular C++ compilers, including Visual Studio. So as you can see, n resembles early C++ 98 days quite closely. But as ODB, and you, you will also find a lot of similar macros and boost. And as, as I just saw in the presentation earlier in Qt as well. But as, as all these projects show, you know, boost, Qt, ODB, with a bit of effort, you can actually create a usable and portable C11 library. It's not particularly nice work, but it's possible. While on, the topic of, uh, while on the topic of library development, let me mention some interesting um, aspect that we've c came up with, <coughs> that we've ran into, I would say. If you can drop C++ 98 support and concentrate on C++ 11, then lucky you. The rest of us, however, will still have to support both standards for years to come. In ODB, we didn't have much trouble supporting both standards from the same code base. You just add, add a whole bunch of WIFDF directives. What we only realized later, however, is to make this support practical, we had to support both standards from the same installation. To understand why, consider what happens to when a, when a library is packaged, let's say, for Fedora <coughs> or Ubuntu. A single library is built is built. A single set of pack headers is packaged. To, to be at all usable, these packages cannot be C++11 or 98 specific. They have to support both standards from the same installation. Yeah, you can probably build and package two separate libraries and ask your users to link to, uh, to a correct one depending on which standard they use. But you will invariably run into tooling limitations. Just to give you one example, the package config utility doesn't have an option to distinguish between C++ standards. The situation with uh, here, this is actually worse unless you prepare to ask your users to pass a specific dash i capital option depending on which standard they use. So the conclusion that we came up we came to was this. If you want your library to be usable in both standards when installed, <coughs> then the C++11 support has to be here there only. Now that, that, is, that is actually a bit different from Tiago's experience from previous talk. Because he, in his case, you, you basically get all different combinations. Library built with 
with C++ 98 or C++ 11. And then you have application build with C++ 98 and 11. And you get these weird combinations when library is built with 98 and application is built with 11. And then there's actually some C++ 11 functions are enabled in the library and some not. So we, we kind of decided to simplify and say, you know, it seems the most straightforward way is to make C++ 11 support here there only. I think Boost also follows the same, the same uh, idea unless the library just drop, dropped support for, for 98. There's some interesting implications of this decision, you know, to go here there only. We initially used autoconf to detect, to detect the C++ uh, mode, but that had to be scrapped. And we now use a much more convoluted and less robust way to detect which mode we are in using macros. Just, just to show you, you know, how the, the first difficulty that you, run, that you will run into when trying to create a portable C++11 library is how to detect whether you're in C++11 mode in a portable way. So I think that just says it all. The other implication of, of this requirement to have C++11 here there only is that all extra functions, all extra C++11 functions, such as move constructors, they have to be either in line or template. Now, that is actually constraining. In ODBV, in most cases, it was OK. So you know you can provide a move constructor as in line and you know if different depending on whether you are running in C++11 mode or or 98 what gets tricky is when you actually need sub you need to implement functions or your data depends on you know it would be much easier to implement if you are in the C++11 mode just to give you a concrete example it's actually a bug in ODB that I realized we have while listening to Tiago's talk. Um, we, in ODB, we allow allow you to use uh, lambdas where we ex where we expose like a callback like mechanism. Just to give you a concrete example, you can register a, a, a prepared query factory. What we do now is we just use the std function, you know, to ha to automatically cover both freestanding functions and, and lambdas. But we actually cannot do that. Because if the live because the de inside the implementation of of this class, we use std function to store the data, which means that it will only work if the library itself is built in the C11 mode. And there's a really not pleasant way to work around that situation. So just kind of an idea. But yeah, overall, so far, it hasn't been too bad. OK, any questions here? OK. And that's it from me for today. I'm all quite a bit earlier than I planned, and I expected more questions. But looks like I made a lot of sense or not. Who knows? So here are some of the resources. Uh, if you if you are interested to kind of go deeper into the topics we've discussed and yeah if you're interested to see how all this is applied in a real project in the real programs then you are welcome to come to my talk on ODB at 11 tomorrow that's it maybe if someone has any other questions then otherwise we are done early Thank you. So the question was, so the ODB is, is, a date, is a, an object relational mapping. So we do a lot of database you know, work in, under the hood. And whether that using C++11 actually made any performance differences. 
I haven't measured that, but my answer would probably, my guess would be that no. Because, well, most, da most databases are client-server kind of set up, which means that, you know, the network access and the time that it takes the database to extract the data, it will just dwarf any C++ inefficiencies that you might have. The only exception is, potential exception is SQLite, which is an in-process database and which is by itself is fairly fast. But yeah, I, I, I don't think it would make big difference. I, I think the, the biggest advantage that we get is from using our value references and move constructors. So we basically eliminate quite a bit of, well, we, we, let, let me put it this way. Those few copies that we actually had, because we tried not to make copies in C++ 98. Right. We, we got them eliminated, but I don't see that it will be a, a huge performance win. Yeah. I think it would be a good talk for next year. <laughs> About performance. Yeah. For somebody to figure out or, you know, do a, you know, real something, semi-real world, mm -hmm. um, you know, to see whether or not, you know, there are you know, real advantages to this R value stuff because, you know, if there aren't real advantages, then you know, I think, unfortunately, the things you've outlined, it's kind of like, well, maybe we should just stick with 98 conventions. Yeah. Just wait. Let me repeat the question and, and I'll answer it then. So the, uh, the comment was that it would be good to have a, a talk next year where someone with some real world experience actually shows us whether all this move semantics and our value reference actually give us any performance advance. Um, I have two actually comments on that. First of all, anyone who cares about performance, even in C++ 98, you know, they, they, they tried not to make copies. Right. So, you know, it's kind of, there's not much insight to optimize. In fact, in ODB, most of the R value stuff is, is like we have, for example, lazy pointers, you know, where you point to an object, but it's, it's not loaded, and then, you know, you can load it on a request. So we kind of du duplicate it. It provides an interface equivalent to shared pointers, so we use move constructors there. Or we have a change tracking container where, again, we duplicate the interface of a std vector, and, you know, we use all the move constructors and our value overload pushback and things like that. So. In, in, in a sense, you know, in, in the implementation, all the, m most of the copies have been eliminated, and where we use our value is to help the user of our library eliminate their copies. And I think it's also the same, uh, same situation with Tiago's talk. You know, as long as you have C++ 98 and 11 to support, you know, you cannot really rely on our value for performance wins inside of your implementation because it, you won't get them in, in, in 98. If you can drop 98 support, then you can convert more of your code to pass by value and things like that. Okay. Question? Actually, I actually have a statement for his question. Just we've been converting a 12-year-old source base over to UC++11. We're still trapped with a, a 98 standard library. But um, just to do some measurements to see if, if loop construction and, and loop operations will help us out, took just two simple classes that were used throughout our about three million lines of code. It just added a move constructor, a move assignment operator, and measured one particular point of, of performance that we're always interested in. And we saw just two minor changes of probably 10 or 12 lines of code, a 6% improvement in that particular measurable process. We know that the performance was throughout the system, but we were just measuring specifically in a known location and easily. It was really quite surprising. It was 6%, mm -hmm. and we just, for fun, charted out. Everywhere I decided to use a copy constructor, every time I decided to do a move operation or assignment operation, just kind of had to just print out a, it looked like a grid. And when you visually saw what was going on, just, you know, M, C, you just, it just, just console it out. It's quite amazing how often the, it was actually being deployed and, and used. Uh, and again, with no particular thought or, or not even looking for a piece of performance code, just some commonly used string activity and uh, a, a CRC that we do to protect against ESD <coughs> RAM so we don't get faulty RAM. It's used constantly. It's pretty, pretty amazing what eight or ten lines of code could do just by implementing those, 
those particular pieces. Okay. So I'd say there's a great opportunity, but I think it's going to be distributed quite wide mm. and not necessarily one of those things where, wow, so much faster. It's just going to be generally faster from what we're seeing. I don't think I'll try to repeat that. <laughs> but the question I have for you: How did you how did you pass these two classes before? Yeah. Was it by value? Passed by reference, and, and um, they were uh, and they were designed internally to be efficient, so they use their own RAM and manage memory as well. Okay, so they were like smart underneath. They well, one was basically um, just a, a utility that anytime you access the value, we have to protect against electrical disturbances. We want to make sure that we don't have RAM corruptions. Mm -hmm. We would detect it immediately. Every time the values are moving through memory, we're calculating a, let's say, 32 bit CRC over mm -hmm. top of them before they're accessed and after they're written, we're calculating constantly. So if you're just doing an assignment, it's always happening in the background. Uh, that was one. The other one was just an older string type uh, class that had been created um, in 1998 <laughs> before uh, standard libraries were actually quite available to us. Mm -hmm. And it's managing basically string operation. It was just two commonly used simple classes we had that we just attacked mm -hmm. just for find out, does it really make a difference? Yeah. And we didn't go after our really complicated time-consuming classes yet. Mm -hmm. We're attacking those in the next year. Yeah, I think you will get a lot of performance wins if you are using, you know, return by, let me call it, by shared, <laughs> by, by dynamic memory, and you change it to return of stack objects by value. Because I don't think a lot of people now return expensive to copy objects by value from the in, in the C++ 98 code. So they, they have some, they either use shared smart pointers and dynamically allocated, or inside the object there's some smartness, you know, some copy on write or reference counting of the, of the, of the underlying data. Yes, question. My assumption is that we're going to see a lot of speed up where you really want at least. In other words, a lot of the code to do stuff like maybe read preferences or something like that it isn't a loop, it's not time critical, but you may be moving strings around and now you might find out that you need those things really fast. So I think you're probably going to see a yes. lot of speed up, but maybe not in the time critical areas where you were already making certain, well, let's not do any stupid copying. Well, you might actually get it because. How, how do you make sure that no, you, if you need to share or let's say return of an object through the stack and you want it to make fast, the only way you do it now in C++ 98 is to use dynamic memory, right? But now what you can do, you can actually allocate the object in this, on the stack and then just kind of move its internal state up, up the stack. So that, I think that's, and that's where you can get a lot of performance win. But the thing is, it's, it's mostly applicable to application development and to libraries that don't need C++ 98 support. Yes, so I just question. to remind everybody of Chandler's point that as soon as you've got a reference argument or a pointer argument, then the optimizer basically says, oh, well, I'm not going to do anything to fix that. So you know, the old approach we took of passing by reference to const meant that the optimizer simply had to assume aliasing and other problems and wasn't going to do nearly as much. So now if we use our value references or pass by value and move things around, we're introducing more opportunities for optimization. Yeah, I guess. So, I, mean, I, I mean, Howard did a presentation, what, a couple of years ago, you know, where he demonstrated in examples, you know, the, the use case for or, you know, the R value reference and how fast it would be, but, you know, this was a toy example. So, um, <clears throat> I'll just say again, I, I'd really be interested in seeing anybody in the audience well, who's working on the real world stuff. You know, I, I remember number. Howard saying the cool thing about R value references is you can make an example that's arbitrarily fast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he did say something like that, yeah. So, hopefully there'll be enough people that are doing these kinds of things. And I, and I guess I'm actually, it, it, it seems to me that there's, even, even where people are being careful, it seems like there might be an opportunity or two in, you know, database access, um, you know, network access, places where there might be, uh, 
you know, some advantages that you, you can't really quite get uh, with the facilities we had up to this point. Like you're saying, I mean, certainly, certainly if you put something in dynamic memory, which is relatively expensive, that's, that's one of the ways you, you handle that now, right? So. Yeah, just to kind of, I don't know if, if you guys want a little bonus material, something that I just thought about today. Just, just to show you, you know, that a lot of the things about this passing and returning of things from, from by value, it's actually a lot trickier than, than, than many people think. You know, remember my guideline about auto, and that you, if you're not modifying the object, then make it a const auto reference. Well, there's actually a, 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 an interesting interaction with that guideline and, and returning the object from a function. Just to kind of give you an idea, what do you think? Will, will this, will C++ move or copy this object out of the function? Neither. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? RBO. It depends, you know, on the phase of the moon whether that's going to be applied. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's one of those cases that's really easy. It's the, you know, like no, the, you don't, the first declared object is what you're returning. You don't know what's easy. in the dots. Maybe I return a bunch of other things, right? But yeah, let, let's say, you know, yeah, a lot of arguments I, I've heard is that, oh, you know, why do you even bother about all this stuff? You know, it's, it will be eliminated. And the compilers are smart enough. In my experience, I, I personally don't like to rely on things that may happen. And my experience with this RVO and named RVO is that, you know, it depends, you know, which optimization level you are in, how complex is your function, you know, the phase of the moon and the mood of the compiler and the whole bunch of other things. But let's assume that, you know, the compiler cannot optimize this away. So it either has to copy or move. That's true. Well, at least that's what GCC and Clang do. I haven't looked in the standard. But my, my second question is why? Why not move it out of here? The, the, the thing will, that will happen, the whole idea and the point of this is that the object is going to die now. So just move it out. The, the destructor that will run on S, it will, it will run in non, on non-const this. So if the next thing that we are going to do is run the destructor, why not move this out of the function? I thought actually it was moved by default now. And then if the type didn't have uh, a move constructor, then it, went, it fell back on the copy. Well, the, this, this, this structure has a move constructor. But the thing that spoils it is this const. But, well, at least my, if, if you remove const, both of them move it out. But if you add const, then they don't. But I don't see a reason why not. Have you brought this up on any of the forums? No, I just came up for this two, two hours ago. Huh? Sorry? Do you have an answer for this? You're asking Yeah, I'm asking. Well, sorry, the question is, well, the two questions are, first one is if I reported it to anyone you know, who is involved in the standardization. And the answer is, no, I just realized that a couple of hours ago. But yeah, I was actually thinking to write to Compass TDC++. And the second question is whether I'm asking for an answer. And yeah, that's, that's, I, I mean, I think that's, that's strange behavior. And I don't see a reason why. I can speculate one. OK. If there was, a, a, say, a, a pointer inside of S that pointed off to some data, expecting when you do the move, but that pointer would be nulled out, so when S destructs at the end, it wouldn't destroy anything because you just moved your the pointer to it. But const is saying, I can't modify that class, mm -hmm. so I can't go back and reach back and destroy that value. No, that makes sense. No, but you still... I'm just speculating. I'm, I'm mm. just saying I know. Just my, my point is to, to this kind of you know reasoning is that the thing that will happen, well, basically what will happen now is we'll make a copy of, of S to return, and then we destroy R. And have you tried 
a adding a constructor to s that instead of just taking uh, s ref ref takes const s ref ref and see if that one gets called because that no, might match a const uh, r value reference instead of just a, an r value reference because I I think he's right I think that const it's saying hey I can't match this and so it goes to copy. I don't think you can overload on. Uh, you can, but the only thing that it will match against is a const r value. It absolutely will not match a non-const r value or any type of l value. I actually looked in this, but what can you do with a const r value? I, 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 I'm just saying to see if this tries to <laughs> if, if if the this. And then <laughs> yeah. but, but, but in this but case, then it's a, you, see you if can that. What you're saying yeah. that you want to have happen is you want the const to be cast away. Yeah, that's what you're saying. I mean, if that's really what you want. No. It no, you bizarre, see, I, I don't want, want. That, that's the difference. <laughs> you know, if you overload on const our value reference, then you can call move on this thing yeah. and it will work. I don't want that. <laughs> that that's not good. Well, that's I just want this specific case when the object is about to, to die, doesn't matter whether it's const or not. You can just move it out. It's a reasonable thought. Yeah, I think. Well, well, I'm pretty sure if you want to allow that, why you wouldn't want to be able to move from a const? That's what you're Because that would be bad. Because <laughs> that, that means. Then you, you have to take yeah. positive action to enable yeah. it. In this way, we're just saying, look, compiler, you know yeah. enough to, that nothing is uh, it's actually gone. changing that object yeah. just before I destroy it. Just let me take yeah. its guts. What about the side effects? But, in this, yeah. but even in this case. Yeah. Oh, I guess you're using R. Well, you know, that's, that's a good point. Uh, when you move out of an object, you still have to leave it in a good state so mm. that its destructor could run or so it could be assigned and so yeah. on. I mean, just generally, for move semantics to work, that has to be the case. So in this scenario, you can't change the state of that const object to put it back into, say, its default constructed state so that it is properly moved from. You're, you're thinking of it, and, and I was thinking the same way for a moment, of I'm moving from it and nothing's going to happen to it afterward, but that's not the case. When you move from something, it's still usable yeah. if you But I mean, you, in it. this case, you know that the only thing that will happen to this object is it gets destroyed, right? Yeah, but what happens when it gets destroyed? Standard move semantics. You need, when you move out of an object, you have to... I'm going to say, what does the constructor do? And can you avoid to... Can you, can you without using move semantics, hmm. not, not let the constructor run, destructor run? Why not? Just it, let's run. say I write to the control register on hardware. In this case, I wouldn't, right? But how does it make, I mean, if I remove const, what, what difference your, will it make? Your move constructor mm -hmm. for that type needs to modify the R value to put it in a destructible state, right. put it in a, you know, whatever state to be reusable because it doesn't know the context in which the move is occurring. Right. And so because of those side effects that he's referring to, it needs to be able to mutate that temporary. Yeah. But in this case, the temporary is const. So you're saying, ignore the fact that it's const, allow me to play mm. with it so that it can get destroyed, and that's mm. violating the type system. What you can do in the specific case is you can cast the const away of the return. You can say, mm. return const cast away. Yeah. But that would probably work. We, can, we can have the, exactly the same side effects in the destructor. You see, a destructor on a const object is run on, on non-const this, right? So. I don't, I kind of it's the move constructor that gets used in mm. lots of contexts, not just this particular one, that is ignorant of the fact that it's operating on a constant but object. It, but it, it knows, really it knows what side effects it ought to have happen because it's moving all of its contents out of this object into some other object, mm. right? So by calling the move constructor, you give the class designer a chance to deal with the fact that, you know, all of the guts of this thing is going somewhere else, mm. and the side effect that should happen or shouldn't happen can happen later. Whereas if you just, and you know, if it's const, then, then so you can't have moves, so that can't happen. So think about if if it wasn't const and you moved R to another object, mm -hmm. then you assign to R. That's what your move constructor needs to deal with. It needs to put R in a state yeah. so that the assignment succeeds. Right. So it can't distinguish that case from this one. And so if this is truly const, then you're not allowed. The move constructor is not allowed to play with the contents of that temporary to put it into that state where it could be assignable. 
So that's where his idea of overloading on a constant R value ref, where you're saying, okay, in, in that case, I won't do anything to the temporary. I'll just steal its guts and hope that nobody ever actually tries to use the temporary. Oh, right? I mean, you know, but still, you've got the whole idea. Even though it's constant, you can cast away constants. You can play all kinds of games. And yeah, I, so I'm still, I don't see the, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I guess I'll be the write it to the people who know more about this stuff. But yeah, I, I kind of don't see a reason why. You know, we're already kind of bending the rules in, in saying that an all value magically at the end of the function is treated as our value. Why can't we also say a const all value is also magically treated as an R value? Because I mean, it's going to die now. Who cares? That's the whole kind of. The L value is mutable in that context. Yeah. Well, this R value isn't. Or actually, this L value isn't. But does it matter? It's gonna. It's gonna be. N the next step is gonna be to destroy it. If you were building a compiler, yeah. I'd imagine unless you had a lot of time to think about the edge conditions that might create, mm. you might just fall back on the same. Yeah. If you're not copyable, it carries you to run. So it may be possible. <coughs> it's, 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 unless someone finds an edge condition that just says, "Hey, there's this weird case where hello, mm. and we'll say this thing is copy. Um, could be just that that decision is made at some point. Or oh, maybe nobody thought about it. I don't Can know. I ask that, a yes, sure. Um, for what practical purpose would you have R declared constant in that example in the first place? Well, because I'm not modifying it. That's, actu that's actually that's actually a, a very good would question. That you in, in a, for a temporary in a, on the stack the function. Have, the only way it actually makes sense Here's. is that somewhere in the dot 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 yeah. you're actually returning other values other than R. Oh, no, so no, in, in this case will just return R, but in other cases, you might return some other value. Or you just want to be able to read the state of it, you know, access various values to use them in the computations of the function before you finally return. And you're just telling the compiler, don't let me mutate this thing in the constructor body. Well, but I mean, from the caller's point of view, if you just are always going to return R, why doesn't the caller just instantiate it? In order for this to really make sense, there's got to be some cases where you return something other than R. Otherwise, the caller would just be able to return it. Yeah. A, a more or less. Did you correct the spell and return the dragon fruit? <laughs> 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 yeah. Thank you. Okay. Hey, a function that does some checking on the return value of another function, G. Plausible, right? And I mean, we are not modifying it, so good practices to declare it constant. But we, but it will host the move. But what is move. that value in practical terms? Uh, uh, okay, somebody uh, said, well, you, okay. Could, you could use it to warn you if you attempted to modify it, okay. But in terms of the way the code's going to work, what would that problem be? The caller doesn't know about G, doesn't know how to call G, doesn't, you know, yeah. it's a private detail, whatever. The reason the caller is calling check S was to get the value. And do some extra and checks. Then, and, yeah. and use it afterward, but in the meantime, you were also going to validate it before they got it. Doesn't seem unreasonable. I mean, this is a toy example anyway, yeah. so. But I mean, I, it's, I don't see why something like this cannot be written in production code. I agree. I don't see anything. And I don't think it, I don't see anything bad with with saying that it's const because I mean I'm not modifying right. it. Agreed. So I would use const in a case like that. Yeah, and you will and you will get a copy instead of move. So yeah, but yeah, I'm gonna write to probably STD C++ news group and see if more knowledgeable people will prove me wrong. <laughs> or you'll get an opposition named after you. <laughs> that would be cool. <laughs> Called pack off return. Huh? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> any other questions? I think we have maybe four minutes left. I think we've exhausted all everything by now. Okay, cool. Thanks. <laughs>